Good evening, church. I'm currently on vacation, so we're doing this week's class through YouTube. But I look forward to being with you next week on Zoom so that we can continue our study in Daniel. But let's go to God in prayer before we open up Daniel chapter 3. Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to gather, to study your word, even though we are spread apart right now. We are just so grateful we live in a nation that allows us to study your word without fear of harm or threat. Father, we know several are struggling with the coronavirus and we ask that you be with them. We know that several are recovering from surgery and we ask that you bless them, help them to recover quickly, help them to know that you are present watching over them and that we are praying for them as well. God, we ask that as we go into your word, help us to be not just those who hear it and forget what it says, but those who learn lessons, lessons of great faith, of strength in times of persecution, in times of uncertainty, uh, lessons that encourage us to stand for what we believe in. Father, we're just so grateful that we have examples such as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we ask that you help us to step up and be examples ourselves in what it means to follow you. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Tonight we're going to be in Daniel chapter 3, if you want to go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter 3, and here we're going to discover what it means to have our faith tested, what it means to have it put to a test and to take a stand in the midst of that test. When was the last time you had your faith tested? When was the last time that you were called out because of your faith or the last time that you had to give into your faith rather than giving in to something else or someone else? Here we are going to get a closer look at Daniel's three friends as well as at Daniel. You see, Daniel is not the only one who was strong in the faith throughout this book. While the book bears Daniel's names, name being that he's the primary prophet, his three friends also show an outstanding example of what it means to have faith in God, to trust God, to know that in the end, God is going to come through. And so we're going to see uh, chapter 3, zoom in on his three friends. And this is their second trial. The first trial is found in chapter 1, as we saw a few weeks ago. You might find it interesting that Daniel is not actually mentioned in this chapter. It doesn't explain why he is missing from the section. It could be that he was on a trip on behalf of the king, and may have been out of the kingdom at this time. Often, Daniel and others would go on trips on the king's behalf. So maybe he was out on a trip. Or maybe he is in the sitting city doing some official business, doing something for the king in the city. Uh, and that's why he's not present. But whatever the reason, Daniel is not mentioned in chapter 3, but his three free friends are, and the book focuses our attention in Daniel's absence on those three friends and their faith. Let's read in Daniel chapter 1, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 1 going through verse 7 here. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, and counselors, and treasurers, and justices, and ma uh, magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, keep this in mind. King Nebuchadnezzar has already learned the God in heaven, Daniel's God, has authority and power. But he's struggling. See, he's not buying into that there is only one God. And now he sets up a statue. And that statue is going to cause problems. But remember, throughout the book of Daniel, God consistently takes man-made problems, problems created by King Nebuchadnezzar or others, 
and he turns them and uses them to glorify him, to return the audience's attention back to the God in heaven. And here we see that we're going to be taken to two extremes. One extreme is worship of the king, and the other extreme is only worship of God. Let's see how this unfolds. They stood before the image in verse 3 that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. In verse 4, And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So they said, When you hear all of this noise and ruckus, fall down and worship. Look what it says in verse 6 and 7, though. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall, shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Now, remember, last week we talked about, or technically it was two weeks ago since we didn't have class last week. Two weeks ago, we talked about that when King Nebuchadnezzar called all of his soothsayers and everyone to give him his dream, Remember whenever he said, we're going to kill them all? We talked about King Nebuchadnezzar is not known for idle threats. King Nebuchadnezzar follows through with his promise of destruction and death. He is known to be hot-tempered. He is known to make severe punishments whenever you do not follow through with what he has asked. And so this is not an idle threat that they will be cast immediately into a burning, fiery furnace. Verse 7, Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, the nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now here, nations is talking about the people groups. It's not that they could hear this from the far reaches of the kingdom. It's everyone within earshot, everyone that saw this. All of the people groups, it, it's representative that everybody did as the king said. Everybody was compliant with what the king asked them to do. What's interesting is sometimes we are asked to comply with things that are not scriptural. Sometimes we are told we have to comply with those things. That might be out in the world. Maybe you're at a job and that job is telling you to do something that is wrong. Or maybe they're asking you to lie about something. Will you comply or will you follow the teachings of God? You see, this is the dilemma that all the people in Babylon, even the God-fearers, are faced with. You may be asked to lie uh, for, to your parents or your employer. Are we ever faced with dilemmas in which we are told to do something against Scripture? Told to believe, to buy into, to worship something? This can happen in churches. We all probably know people who worship tradition more than scripture because they count tradition as thus saith the Lord rather than scripture as being God's word. And the way they do it is fancy. They look in scripture and they say things such as you can never touch alcohol when truth is scripture doesn't say that. Scripture says you can never become drunk. However, if you're under 21, it is sin for you to drink. I remember a long, long, long time ago, whenever I was in the little bitty town of Clayton, we had a preacher come in that was only there for a few months. But those few months created chaos in the church because in those few months, that preacher taught scripture said, celebrating things such as Christmas and Easter was sin. And he made everybody feel guilty. Well, church, that's not scriptural. You see, sometimes we are left in these dilemmas of where we have to decide. And 
I have not run across this in our congregation, but there are churches out there that are asking their members, if you will, they don't ask, but they're forcing their members to decide between tradition or man-made laws and scripture and God's laws. Thank goodness God made it easy for us, right? Love God, love others. Isn't that a blessing to us? Isn't that a blessing? Here we see King Nebuchadnezzar making an image of God to worship. It shouldn't be surprised, uh, a surprise to us, I mean, as many kings in the ancient world would do the same thing. They would build monuments in honor to themselves and to their gods. There is, however, a connection with the image of the dream in chapter 2 and the building of this image of gold in chapter 3, which is kind of interesting but the kings would often make images to honor themselves. Do we do that? We may not make images, but do we build buildings to honor ourselves? Do we do things that honor ourselves? Why do we choose to do what we want to do? So many people want to preach in the pulpit and teach and and there's nothing wrong with teaching and there's nothing wrong with desiring to preach but do you ask yourself why do you ask yourself if you're willing to put in the effort that goes into that this is why scripture says not many of you ought to de ought to desire to be these things why well one because we're judged at higher standards in in god's eyes but also because you don't just willy-nilly stand up and start speaking. The gift of gab does not make a good teacher or preacher. It makes a dangerous preacher or teacher. This is why I don't like the, uh, I forgot what they call them, but impromptu kind of lessons. Because there's been no effort put into it. And you cannot rightly handle the word of God if you do that. But so you see, why do we make the choices we make? Why do we decide to build the things we build and desire the positions or the recognition that we desire? Is it for the glory of God or for the glory of us? That makes the biggest difference in the world. Nebuchadnezzar builds his own image in this big statue. It's possible, one author writes, that King Nebuchadnezzar studied the statue of his dream and realized that each following kingdom is weaker and weaker. And now the king wants to show himself strong enough that the stone which hit and crushed the feet and brought the image and all it represents to an end could be stopped if he, the head of gold, were to become the entire statue. And we don't really know. That was just one author's opinion and thought on it. I don't really think that's the truth. But... It's of interest. The statue is 90 feet high, 9 feet wide. A cubic represents around 18 inches. We aren't sure where the plains of Dura is located, but it has become narrowed down to three possible locations. And so uh, I would encourage you to go look into that. Uh, when Upon building the statue, the king sends out word to everybody in the kingdom, if you will, especially those in the area, especially also those in high power, that they should come to the dedication of this. And so we see masses of people coming to this dedication. And, and we see those who ruled over large divisions of the empire oh, and others that were high-ranking officials who came um, that were given responsibility. We saw governors of districts and small regions, and we saw people who gave counsel to the officials and uh, encouraged them on judgments, all of these individual judges and treasurers, magistrates, all of these came. This dedication was both political and religious. Back in the ancient times, they were often blended together. It was intended to start a practice in the kingdom to make a new ruling, which we saw happen, to help set the stage for what the king desired moving forward. They were told to worship when they hear all this noise and those who would not worship, who would not comply, they would go to a, on a trip to a fiery furnace and be burned alive. 
So this is the scenario. This is what took place. And this is what happens when people become full of themselves, right? This is what happens when people are the object of worship or desire, if you will, to be the object, object of worship rather than desiring God to be the object of worship. And let's see what happens because now enter those who we saw in chapter one, the three friends who are known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three friends of Daniel. In verse 8, here's what we see here. Therefore, at the time at the time certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O oh, king, live forever. We've seen that before. This happens often. It's just a normal way you agree to king. You, O oh, king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, parp, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. He, they remind him, King, this is what you said. And then they say this in verse 12. There are certain Jews. Now, who might that be? I believe there is jealousy here. I believe that it's not just that they're not following the rules. I believe what's going on is, remember, Daniel and his friends have risen in the ranks by this point. I think there's some jealousy going on. And jealousy can lead us to, even if they're not lying, throwing people under the bus that don't need to be thrown under the bus. And notice they didn't go talk to these three friends first. They went to the king and tattled first. There are certain Jews whom you have pointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. See, it's not us, it's those you appointed over. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, granted, two of those were accurate. They're not worshiping the image, and they're not serving the king's gods. But did you notice they said they don't pay attention to you? They don't listen to you. It's an accusation that they're never worried about what the king says. They're never paying attention and obeying what the king says. It's a generalization. Look at verse 13. Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that the three be brought to him. So they brought these men before the king. And in verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar answered, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, and all these instruments, I'm honestly getting tired of saying them. When you hear these things, fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? That should be underlined in this chapter. That is the crucial point and the answer, or I'm sorry, that is the question this entire chapter is answering and exploring who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Remember, King Neb has set up a statue to worship himself and his gods. He believes that he is the supreme being. And he believes there is no God that can help Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego once the king gets a hold of them. He says, in other words, there is no God that can save you. If there is, tell me who he is, because I don't know of this God. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, by the way, did you notice they didn't give him a chance to blow all the harps and lyres and everything. They, they answered. They knew what their answer was going to be when the music sounded. Do you know what your response will be when you are asked to do something against the word of God, when you're asked to follow someone other than Christ, when you're asked to follow tradition over scripture, do you know what your response will be ahead of time? Planning is the key. 
first you got to know the scripture first you got to know what's being taught in it so that you know whether or not it corresponds with what god asks you to do but plan do you know what you will say if somebody asks you to give a reason for your belief do you know what will you will do if you are faced with death if you confess christ are we preparing our teens and our children for that as well are we helping them to know their response the importance it is to have that response ready and to trust god in the midst of whatever fallout comes shadrach meshach and Abednego knew their answer and they gave their answer oh king nebuchadnezzar we have no need to answer you in this matter if this be so our god whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand O king look at this if this be so our god whom we serve he is able to deliver us from the furnace they didn't know in my opinion they didn't know whether he would or would not deliver them but they knew he would somehow take care of them he would deliver them from the hand of god he, God is able to put them in the furnace. They didn't know for sure they would go into that furnace because God may intervene before they walk into that furnace. But they knew he is able to deliver them not only from the furnace, but from the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar. They answer the king with, you're not nearly as great as you think you are. God in heaven is greater. Verse 18. But if not... In other words, we know God can deliver us, but if God chooses not to deliver us, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden images that you have set up. Church, sometimes we forget that just because we think God should rescue us, we forget that doesn't mean God will rescue us. Now, God will ultimately rescue his people, from the ultimate death, the ultimate fiery furnace, right? Hell, if we follow him. But on earth, sometimes God will allow us to suffer. God will allow us sometimes to die for doing the right thing. Are we okay with that? I've said before that there are Christians in China that go to the Middle East because they say we're, we already die for our faith here. What's the difference in dying for our faith over there? Do we have that mentality that we understand that sometimes God will not save us in the here and now? Sometimes God will use us by allowing us to suffer consequences or to suffer harm and maybe even death for the sake of his name. But we don't like to talk about that much as Christians but we need to. Guys, all of us, all of us in this congregation are in the top percent of those of this world with money. We have money, we have houses, regardless of how big or how small of a house, you have more than majority of people in this world have. But God may call us away from that someday. God may ask us to do something we don't want to do. Being blessed doesn't mean that we escape consequences for doing the right thing, if that makes sense. My kids were watching the other night the... Uh, Mulan, not the animated series, but the other series, the uh, newer one. Wow, it's kind of dark for a kid's movie, by the way. Um, but uh, we were kind of watching that, and I've never seen it. I thought it was pretty interesting, but one thing I really appreciated about it is the emphasis they put on her coming clean to the commander, even when it meant death execution 
Are we willing to do the right thing regardless of the consequences? Even if we know God could save us, but are we willing to do it if God chooses not to save us? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were because they said, if God chooses not to, we want you to know we still will not serve your gods or worship the image that you have set up. Are we willing to say that? Even if God doesn't come to my rescue, I still will do the right thing. Even if I have to die, I'm telling whoever it is in the face, I still will not give in. That's faith. That's trust. That's strength. Well, King Nebuchadnezzar is going to try to make their wish come true here. Verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was, feel, was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We see this changed against in the Old Testament quite a bit, quite a lot, especially with God, whenever one is, um, it's that idea of uh, 180. He, he's hoping almost that they'll give in, but now he just becomes furious. Why has he become furious? Probably because they said to his face what he didn't want to hear. Remember, King Nebuchadnezzar is all about himself. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. In other words, what's he saying? You think you serve a God that'll save you? Okay. We'll order this furnace to be way hotter than you could ever have imagined. He orders some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. By the way, I never noticed before now that they had hats on. I've read this countless times, even in preparing for this. I literally had never caught on that they had hats on. Now I want to know what kind of hats they wore. Verse 22, because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He, de he declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the furnace? They answered and said to the king, True, O king, yes, we threw three in. And look what he says. But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Isn't that amazing? No time passes, and all of a sudden he goes, wait a minute, we threw three guys into there, right? Oh yeah, that's how many we threw in. Well, why is there four? And not only that, none of them are bound up, and they're just casually walking around, having a good old time, having some sort of discussion, not being harmed. In fact, they come out, they don't even smell like smoke. Then King Nebuchadnezzar came in verse 26 near the door of the burning fiery furnace and he declared Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego servants of the Most High God. Look, we now have him giving recognition to God in heaven. It is not servants of a God. It is not servant to the God. It is servants to the Most High God, a God higher than himself, a God higher than the God he serves. Servants of the Most High God, come out here. Come over here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw the fire had not had any power over the bodies of, the me of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. No smell of fire had come upon them. It was as if they never walked in. You see, they trusted that God would take care of them, but they understood even if God choose, 
not to do so. God was still worth following. And because of their faith and their strength, God saved them from the fire. God was amidst them in that furnace. And you know what I love? It wasn't for their glory, it was for God's. And this is identified by the king doesn't praise Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He praises God in heaven, the God of heaven. Look what he says, verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Did you catch what he said? Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because of what the God in heaven, the most high God, as he put it, did, he praises their God, not them. But then look, he praises them. He explains why God did this. It's because they ignored him in things that were not consistent with God's teachings. And therefore, he makes a new decree. Verse 29. Therefore, I make a decree any people, nation, or language that speaks anything. In other words, says anything negative about the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? The question of the chapter was, what God is there who can save you from my hand? And the answer was, there is one God, the God in heaven, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and there is no other God who can possibly do what this God has done. Now, don't over estimate what he's saying. He's not saying no other gods exist here. He is saying there is one God above all gods, and it's not him, and it's not his God. It is the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And because of that, he says nobody is allowed to speak a word against that God. Yahweh, yod heh -Vah -Heh. No one is allowed to speak a word. And if anyone speaks a word, they'll be torn limb from limb. And their house, and this is household is the meaning, will be brought to rubble. In other words, there won't be a single survivor, whether that's livestock, people, or material things. This is how serious it was. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. What's interesting here is King Nebuchadnezzar does a 180. King Nebuchadnezzar, it never says he took down his statue in this chapter. This chapter doesn't tell us any other major changes that were made with the exception of, he says, don't speak badly about the God in heaven, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's friends were willing to suffer fate of fire rather than disobey their God, rather than to give in to the king. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's three friends, are examples of faith, strength, dedication, and what God can do. Because of this, the king praises God for the demonstration of God's power as he saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When we make it through something, that we never wanted to be in, that we were unjustly introduced to, if you will, or thrown into, when we survive something that seemed unsurvivable, 
when we're getting all the attaboys, girls. Are we willing to point it to God, to make God the hero of the story? Are we willing to say what we have accomplished, what we have done, what we will do and what we will accomplish is only by the grace of God and what God has done in and through us? It doesn't mean that we're not good or skilled. God gave us great skill sets. God gave us great things, but are we willing to point it back to God? There is no other God who is able to deliver in this way, King Nebuchadnezzar said. Are we pointing people to that same idea? Do we have the faith and the strength and the endurance so that we can go through any of our fiery trials that we are faced with? And when we come out on the other end, or if God decides to allow us to be burned up in those, we'll have at least lived a life or if we come out on the other end, we'll be able to continue to live a life that declares God is in control. God is great. We serve a powerful God. The story of these three Jewish men is probably one of the most well-known stories in the Old Testament. Hebrews 11 verse 34, we see a referral to Daniel chapter 3. It says, they quenched the fury of the flames an illusion that appears in a long list of the heroes of faith. Here in Hebrews, the author, 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 the author believes in Daniel chapter 3 took place in the 6th century BC exactly as they were related. He believed that these were great stories or a faith that it wasn't just something made up. It was a true historical story event that took place and therefore we can learn from it the question i want to ask or one of the questions tonight is where do you stand when your faith is being tested do you stand with daniel's three friends shadrach meshach and abednego willing to enter into the fire whether or not god's going to choose to pull you out of the flames? Do you stand with them when your faith is being tested? Or do you give in? You see, we all probably struggle with that question. And if you give in from time to time, it's not the end of the world. You pick yourself back up and you repent to God and you go back to following God. We all stumble. We all fall. But if we have a plan, we're more likely to stand strong in our faith, to model the faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I want to encourage you this week to evaluate your faith and the strength of your faith, to create a plan for those times you know that you may face a fiery furnace of your own. Have a plan for it. Resolve that you'll stand strong. Know what scripture teaches here. And put your trust in God, regardless of what you think the outcome might be. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the many blessings you give to us. We are so grateful for this story that teaches us the strength of faith and how if we stand strong in the faith, it can lead to worship of you by others, to recognition of you from others. Father, help us to continue to be a blessing to all those that we meet. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Next week, we'll be in Daniel chapter 4 on Zoom. I'll see you then. God bless.